Hello and uh, welcome to the gender neutral hobby space in internet web space. Oh yeah. I am Snoda and uh, with me today I have uh, the lovely uh, Roman god Adam. Oh, how do you do? Who loves Snoda? to nibble his pru uh, uh, his prunes. There we go. <laughs> nibble my prunes. You can nibble my yeah, prunes. Yeah, your your anytime. grapes by the pool. Yes. Oh yeah, I've been having quite the time. Actually, I was hoping that uh, wasn't the intro. No, but, well, oh, it could whatever. be. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll we'll leave it to Jason. Yeah, Lil, he can Jason decide. can decide whether he wants to do that or not. But welcome to episode 62 of Masters of the Forge. Uh, this episode is actually a continuation of our... Uh, uh, from episode 59, where folks listen to a audio short story written by me, uh, called the, um, Black Deeds. And this will be the on your tabletop portion of that, where we have some cool special characters and scenarios. Uh, but until then, uh, Snorri, what have you been up to, my friend? It's been quite quiet on my front uh i painted some uh some um, some more plague marines uh they're not still not done but uh you know a little bit here and a little bit there and some details now and details later and suddenly they will be done nice eventually hopefully this summer yeah you have a lot going there like you you picked a you picked up like a, just a lot of models and and decided to batch paint a large number, yeah. which is very efficient, so there, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, you're talking by the end of summer, not this week or whatever. <laughs> I, I, if I sit down and concentrate and just do this, then it, they're done within a few days. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I got other things I also like to do. Yeah. So um, this is going to be more of a slow burner kind of thing. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, as for the whole batch painting. Uh, because of the way I paint my uh, miniatures with the airbrush when I'm doing the last detail or well, not like the last detail but uh, when I'm doing the last highlight it's just a really tiny quick just over all the models um, with a really pale green and then if you're going to do that to 10 models you're going to put a drop in there and you're not even going to use half of it mm -hmm. so it's like just Get a lot of models, and then uh, yeah. you have a little bit, a little more to go on. Might as well. Yeah. So they're they're moving forward, but uh, slowly. Nice. That's great. Um. So well, I I've had uh, we haven't really had a proper like just sit down and chat type intro in a long time, and uh, so I've gotten some hobby progress backed up. I have a couple trucks that I did. Like, I did that 1,000 points for July, I think, or no, for June, which it really took a lot out of me, so I, I decided to do one truck. But I already had a truck built, and I was able to turn that one truck into two trucks, so I had a total of three trucks, so I painted three trucks, Two of them in that blue and yellow scheme I've been working on of late, and one of them in a red and yellow scheme. I've moved from uh, using yellows, actually. I started to do uh, Tau Light Ochre for my base coat for the yellows, and that's worked out really nicely. And then, like, the Averland Sunset is more of a highlight than a base. Like, I know, I know that we're kind of supposed to try to go along with the... You know, GW tells us what color, what the colors are for, base, pigment, or base, layer, highlight, but sometimes they end up being whatever. <laughs> yeah. So the main thing about the their base range is really just, it covers really it well, really, really fast. It so does. It's, it's really great. And it, and it works really well if they're, if you need to water them down, it's not a big deal. They, they, if you, uh, if you, if you thin them, it's, it's not a big deal. They, they thin very easily. Yeah. Um I, is it is it hot at your place? Oh, it's really hot. It's really hot yeah. here. And that, that that has been one of the things that caused me to or that's been one of the reasons why I haven't been painting a lot lately also. It, it's just too hot. The paint just dries up way too fast. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't dry up here cuz it's so muggy, but it it is a detriment for two reasons. One, you don't feel like doing it. Two, 
it's so nice out that you want to go do stuff. So we've got a pool and we're always out in the pool. And by the time we're done with the pool and dinner and everything, it's like nine o'clock at night and it's, you know, I don't feel like doing it, but I've had a few days where I've had some progress and a couple of days I actually spend the pool building stuff you know, in the pool, which was really cool. Um, yeah. I saw some pictures of that. That, uh, that's creative. <laughs> so just as I suspected, the Hero Quest project, the the secret project for Geek End is uh, going to come down to the wire. <laughs> so I hope that turns out okay. I've got some guys painted right now. Uh, hopefully be able to start the uh, – hopefully going to start the – I can I, – you know, I could do the tiles in the pool. So I might start that today, start casting the tiles in the pool. I need something like 700 – tiles wow <laughs> and, it, and the thing makes oh, like luck. the thing makes like nine tiles so <laughs> you you're gonna be quite industrious for a few weeks I hope so um so i've been working on that uh, i've been playing a lot of league games snorri we've been having a summer like team league that we've we've been doing escalation been doing painting and stuff that's part of like the orcs i've been painting i've been part of that and I've had a yeah. great time that doing this team, this team league. It's we just randomly pair everyone up, and uh, ran, well, I say randomly. It's been more narrative pair ups. So it's like, oh, you guys, you guys are playing Space Marines, and these guys are playing some like, you know, Eldar or whatever. Okay, why don't you guys face each other? But sometimes, you know, you can't do that just yeah. based on who's there. Yeah, summertime tends to be really slow for most people so the fact that you're actually having a, a i guess that it's slightly less uh leaguey than the normal type league but yeah. uh still it, it is it qualifies as a league right it's more fun it's more friendly fun type stuff we a lot of our guys are definitely like not showing up because of summer stuff so i feel lo- yeah. i feel lucky that we get we get like two teams or three teams going every week, every Monday. So that's pretty sweet. Um, we're going to cap it off with a friendly tournament and we'll talk about that in the outro. Mm. Um, I had, I went to the portal in uh, Connecticut for some games. That was pretty cool. Uh, they use like the Nova open format, which is really rough. It's, it's super rough, dude. <laughs> it's so scary. They don't have any restrictions on like rerollable saves or anything like that. But they also don't. They also restrict strength D ranged weapons. So, like, you know, when you have a two plus rerollable invulnerable save and no D weapons to combat it with, it's like really, really, really hard. I don't think I ever want to play in. A Nova format again. I mean, I'm definitely going to go to the the portal again. The portal is a great place to go and have games, but uh, I'll go back in a couple in a few in a couple months when they go back to using the ITC format because I can't. The Nova is just too much for me. I can't handle it. <laughs> it's a proper fondue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like you're just you're just you just got all your chocolate and people are putting carrots in the chocolate and it's not you don't it doesn't work. Um. <laughs> what the hell do you call a fondue in the U.S.? A fond- Where I come from, a fondue is cheese. Oh, cheese, right. You're Melted right. cheese in a pot, and you stick bread in it. No, no, you know what? Here's the thing. No, that's the way it's supposed to be. But when you say, when you say like, now all... America. America. I'm sure it's called some... It's supposed to be called something else, but... Yeah. Uh, well... You are from the country that invented the croissant wish. Yeah. So yeah. Like, wait, how can we make this better? Oh, I know. Let's make it candy instead. <laughs> uh, oh, never mind. One last thing. Uh, I went down to Poughkeepsie last Wednesday uh, to play with a friend, Mark Gottlieb. I think he actually does. Um, I think he actually does uh, game design for Mantic Games. But uh, he he was demoing Age of Sigmar, so we went down there and played Age of Sigmar. I brought my dorks because they worked perfectly with you know because there's demons, and uh, my buddy brought his brother's Chaos Warriors, and uh, that was I must say a lot of fun. Uh, Age of Sigmar is awesome. 
I I don't know. I, I I'm looking forward to building a Seraphon army, but the dorks are just fine. I can use those in my game, so yeah, pretty cool. Really happy with that. So I I don't know. I I'd like to try to get some games going up here, but I can't I can't run another gaming group. I just don't have the time. So hopefully there's someone out there who would be who'd be willing to pick up the mantle and and run an Age of Sigmar group in our area. But other than that, I'm I'm tapped out. That's what I've been up to, Snorri. Um so looking forward respectable to respectable amount of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to the summer. Looking forward to the rest of the summer. Looking forward to Geek End coming up. So uh, yeah. I'll definitely have a report on that when I get back. Yeah, I'm I'm just looking forward to the sun going down because then temperatures come down mm-hmm. and I can actually do some hobby. Yeah, the fall. The, I am you know I love the summer, but I am looking forward to the fall. I had a friend post say, "Hey guys, cider donuts, picking apples." Wearing silly looking boots. Who's who's ready for fall? And I'm like, ah, I have a pool, so. But still, yeah, <laughs> I, I am looking forward to the fall, though. So. Apple pie. Apple mother With cream. Pie. Oh yeah. All right, so I guess we'll we'll go ahead and we'll take a break, and we'll when we come back, we'll start talking about the Black Deeds campaign on your tabletop. Greetings, mofo's. Are you out of George Dickle number eight, staring at a broken chess machine? Uh, Don't want to spend the rest of the year tied to that couch? Well, why don't you head on over to the One Hour a Night Facebook page and see what exciting stuff is going on there. It's a place to post all your daily progress in the hobby grind, as well as receive and give positive feedback. Also, there are usually a few interesting challenges going on. That's right. Uh, All you have to do is search for One Hour a Night on Facebook. That's numeral one hour a night all one word blood serum tests will be administered prior to approval set the hell with or come to the week the arica bich that in slugs ting then imitate a bich when the arica de come to the week idioter what he said hey everyone this is justin from the it will not die podcast if you love listening to podcasts that are positive and excited about the hobby come check us out We're on the Freebooters Network now, along with other great podcasts like The Independent Characters, 40K Radio, D6 Generation, Nerd Herders, and many more. And remember, it doesn't matter how you love the hobby, just do it. Nailed it. Hey, Masters of the Forge listeners, are you looking to expand your Warhammer 40,000 gaming group? Do you want to start a 40K club in your area? Do you want the people you attract to be like-minded mofos? Do you want to advertise your YouTube channel? Or even attract more subscribers to your hobby blog or online community? Then what better way than to advertise on the Masters of the Forge podcast? All we ask of you is that you email us at mastersoftheforge at gmail.com or message us on Facebook with a full text of your advertisement, including the region in which you live and any contact information people can use to get a hold of you. We will have one of our many tech servitors read your advertisement on the air. We promise not to make fun of you. Though we can't always predict the actions of our servitors, you really can't find good help these days. No, you can't. Welcome back. Uh, so I. I, we actually haven't had a proper like on your tabletop full episode yet, and I, I'm I'm a little wary of it right now because it's weird. Because whereas before you'd have like this big chunk of um, like narrative that we would talk about, and then we would have maybe a shorter on your tabletop section after it. So I almost feel like you know. I feel like the on your tabletop section, like episodes, need to be pretty chunky. So this is the first opportunity I think we've had where I felt like I could get a good chunk of content in for on your tabletop. So I hope you folks uh, enjoy it. Yeah, and well, the format is never fully set. We have changed it recently. So Mm -hmm. um, if the single full episode of just on your tabletop doesn't quite work out then we'll just have to adapt yeah yeah exactly this is all we're so this is all us like kind of 
feeling our way through it and and uh finalizing the format and you know as time goes it may change so yep so we're gonna start with some characters so as you'll recall galvanus is the chaos lord in charge of the brotherhood of blades i'm i'm hoping to develop him as a as a good as a relatable character uh as someone who feels at least partially human, someone you can relate to. And uh, he's pretty awesome, though. Yeah, let's see. What, what do we have? Um, he's got a power sword, a bolt pistol. Uh, he has spined artificer armor and the chain of dark purpose. Um, he's he's enormous, even for a start ace. So we gave him a strength of five rather than just a four. And we put him at 170 points. Um. The artificer armor is like these plumes of poison spines. Imagine like a porcupine. He's got like porcupine-like spines all over his armor. And it actually keeps enemies alive who would otherwise perish from grievous wounds. Um, sometimes Galvanus simply leaves his opponents to die in excruciating pain on the battlefield. Other times he uses the poison as a opportunity to capture his enemies and put them to the question. Or whatever purpose he has for them, really. Uh, he gets plus one attack in close combat with the poison special rule. So it's just a normal attack. Um, and he's got a thing called the Chain of Dark Purpose. If you recall, his armor kind of has this chain welded to all the plates. And it wraps around and, and hooks. They all, they're all linked to a chain that's around his neck. And it actually threads through his own flesh of his of his shoulder and neck um and it basically what it does is it binds him to his duty as his duty to the war master and by the war master in this of course we don't mean uh, uh we don't mean uh, horus we mean uh, abaddon uh he has the eternal warrior and it will not die special rules in addition he enjoys a five plus invulnerable save I thought that made sense for his, for the chain has other meanings too that I don't want to reveal now. Uh, but I, I think it, I think it makes him, it gives him some interesting rules to go with the character. Makes him quite a beast. Yeah. Yeah. It, it lets him kind of, it gives him some defensive abilities that, cause you kind of want the character to stick around for a little while and, and do some stuff in the game unless he comes up against something truly horrific. Um, yeah. We also came up with this uh, Ascendant Brother kind of template. Uh, it's basically a upgrade that you can apply to any Space Marine veteran or um, Space Marine Sword Brother or a, a Chaos Aspiring Champion. A Sword Brother is kind of the, the veteran in a squad of um, Black Templar Crusade Squad. So basically a veteran. Uh, for 15 points, they get an additional wound, so they have two wounds, and plus one leadership. So most, for the most part, that'll be 10 leadership. For the purposes of, like, this campaign, Champion Zige and Champion Corian count as Ascendant Brothers. What do you think about that, Snorri? Just having that extra, like, extra veteran-y veteran for your squads? So, like, a sergeant, what is it? Sergeant? general or whatever he's called in the uh, armed forces over there in the u.s mm. basically he's been or this person has been in uh, in the service probably longer than just about every officer above them so it is the one person you do listen to they do have all the knowledge from having been there probably 10 years longer than anyone else and in the case of space marines probably a hundred years longer <laughs> than everyone else <laughs> So they've pro probably seen it all, and as a result, they know that they have that leadership bonus. Yeah, I really like that. Cool. Cool, thanks. Champion Corian is a basic Chaos Champion, but with the Ascentant Brother upgrade. So that's another 15 points. He also wields a Power Sword for 15 points, and a Volkite Serpenta for 15 points. Volkite Serpentia is pretty cool. It's a pistol, but it's only 10 inches. A lot of the Volkite stuff is like at a weird inch. They're at fives instead of sixes. Um, strength five, AP five. It's a pistol and it has the deflagrate special rule. So it basically turns organic matter explosively into ash and jetting fire. So that means it can, uh, it can, it can affect other models in the, in the unit. So, um, 
they get another uh, additional hits whenever uh, it takes a wound. So I thought that was pretty cool. Like exp- yeah. it, it turns it turns the body into an explosive device. <laughs> That's nasty. It was pretty nasty. Uh, moving on, uh, Champion Corian also has the Veterans of the Long War upgrade, regardless of whether he his unit does. In addition, Champion Corian has inte- has the Intelligence special rule. Which is that if the if Champion Corian is part of your army, you may reroll the dice when determining mission type. If you do not take advantage of this ability, or if the mission is predetermined by the narrative, then any unit Champion Corian is part of gains this scout special rule instead. In total, Champion Corian costs an additional seventy points above the usual cost of a Chaos Champion. Yeah, so that that's regardless of what kind of unit he's a part of. Yeah, and uh, note that you should feel free to use any squad champion that you desire to upgrade to Champion Corian, as he is a master of disguise and inf- infiltration. To forge the complete narrative, when deployed with the Lord Galvanus, Champion Corian usually leads Galvanus' squad of Chosen. In the field, Corian will usually lead a squad of Havocs or Chaos Space Marines. Right, he's usually either in the back, you know, de- observing the, the battle or doing something tactical with some chaos space marines but but with Galvanus he's always with the chosen cuz they're you know in charge uh next we have champion Zige Zige is a chaos champion with the ascendant brother upgrade obviously um he's got 3 gifts of mutation because sure <laughs> you could tell from the story he kind of is a little messed up He's got a bolter, bolt pistol, and chainsword, two points. In addition, Zige and whatever unit he is a part of gains the opportunist special rule, which means uh, he and his unit gain the zealot rule if engaged in close combat with an enemy with either a strength or toughness of three or less. Conversely, they gain the hit and run special rule if engaged in close combat with an enemy with a strength or toughness five or greater, or a walker. Basically, if you're if they're in close combat with a unit that's weaker than them, they they're they're pretty much fearless. And if they engage with a unit that's tougher than them, they run away. <laughs> in total, Zige costs an additional fifty points above the usual cost of a Chaos Champion. Uh, to forge the narrative, Champion Zige is best used as an upgrade for a non-marked Chaos Space Marines unit in power armor. And the last character for uh, the supplement is the Hedge Witch. Many aspiring Chaos leaders rely on the gifts of the warp for success. Chaos Space Marine sorcerers are in high demand, however, and have aspirations of their own. The Hedge Witch is an aug- unaugmented human with the ability to harness the warp. However, this is far more risky than relying on a well-trained acolyte of the Dark Powers. For the purposes of forging the narrative for Black Deeds, the crone is a hedge witch. Yep. So the stats lines for a hedge witch are weapon skill 2, ballistic skill 3, a strength of 2, a 3 toughness, 1 wound, 2 initiative, a single attack, and leadership 8. And uh, their battlefield role is a bit special, so we're getting to that uh, in a little while. Uh, their faction is Chaos Space Marines, and they are a 40-point model. The unit type is a uh, infantry of type helpless character, which is an interesting one. <laughs> uh, the unit composition is a single witch. Their war gear is a close combat weapon, and that's it. And they are a level 1 psyker. They have three rules attached to them. Uh, they are helpless, which means that uh, helpless characters may not accept or issue challenges, even if they are part of a faction which normally requires them to do so, and Chaos Space Marines are. Moreover, models must attempt to look out Sir for helpless characters if they can. So this one is not going to be the one you stick up front so they can soak bullets. Nope. The second rule is Warlord's Pet. The Hedge Witch always moves with and joins units along with your army's Warlord. They are not an independent character, but acts as such for movement and joining purposes when moving with the Warlord. 
In addition, the hedge witch may not move farther than two inches from the warlord for any reason. If events would cause such a thing to happen, all other models in the unit must shift to allow the hedge witch to find their proper place by their master's side. So the, this person is definitely on a leash. Yes. <laughs> Whether it's uh, for uh, for the uh, psyker's safety or for the uh, warlord's safety. Either we, way, we right? Discussed. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the final rule is puppets of the gods. Whenever the hedge witch would take a wound from perils of the warp, roll a die. On a three plus, if the warlord is still alive, they take the wound instead. Yeah, so basically it's th that corruption is being passed to the warlord instead of the witch, which I think is pretty pretty interesting, actually. Um, and it kind of goes along with the events of the story. So there's a few, uh, there are a few options attached to the hedge witch, which are that they may take up to three gifts of mutation for 10 points each. They can take a last pistol for three points, Upgrade to a level 2 Psyker for 25, uh, and they may also purchase one of the following Chaos Marks. A Mark of Siege for 5 points, a Mark of Nurgle for 6 points, and a Mark of Slanesh for 4 points. For obvious reasons, there's no corn Mark for a Sorcerer, or a Hedge Witch. Yeah. <laughs> Just like in the rule book. <laughs> uh, they also have a, the Gift of the Gods, uh, which is that uh, if a Hedge Witch has a specific Mark of Chaos they may select powers from that god's discipline. Right, from the Chaos Space Marines rulebook. Here's, you know the interesting thing? Like, like uh, I, had a, I had a brief conversation on Facebook regarding Dice and Die. There's a, they just released a Age of Sigmar FAQ. One of the questions in the Age of Sigmar FAQ was, wherever, when it, sometimes the rules say one dice. Do you mean, or, or sorry, the rules say roll a dice. Do you mean roll one die? And they say, well, uh, what, saying die when referring to one dice is a slightly archaic way of saying it. Uh, something, so, something to that effect. And we use the more modern one dice. I'm like, yeah. really? I would. I am so. because uh, I know. I know throughout all of GW's publications that they're. You know, it's all one dice, one dice, one dice, and I'm. It just seems grammatically incorrect to me. And, but yeah. it's still what they use. And I, I posted that, and uh, Andy Chambers was like, "Yeah, so he said something about us puritanical Americans." <laughs> <laughs> murdering of the language or something but it's just like here in norway mm -hmm. uh if you have a base if you're wearing a baseball cap mm -hmm. you're not wearing a cap everyone here says you're wearing a caps <laughs> it's like no that's the plural stop saying that i just seriously i, I mean like I don't, I don't see it as a modern version of die i i see it as a People are too lazy to learn the actual plural form of the word. Exactly. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah. I, I saw the discussion and it was like, wow. So you can actually say both. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep saying a die. <laughs> so we have two um, kind of – we have a detachment and a formation to go along with this stuff. Um, the first the first one is a detachment that's like kind of a combi detachment for the blade of the – or so the Brotherhood of the Blade. Um, the, the the detachment is actually called Blade of the Brotherhood because they separate their kind of units into blades, and so um, this would be this would represent kind of one blade going into battle. And this would be kind of what you what uh, Zige was in charge of when he was uh, taking over the uh, stations. Uh, they're a mobile chaos warband who. Uh, excel at identifying targets, deploying lightning raids upon them. They have organized their warband into nimble and somewhat independent groups called Blades. While they must ultimately answer to Lord Galvanus, they are free to operate on their own. This allows the warband to operate in cells, which are far more difficult to pin down by the Imperium. They are meant to hit a target and immediately disengage with their quarry. Consequently, if a single blade finds itself somehow locked in a protracted battle, it is likely to find itself abandoned by the rest of the Brotherhood. 
So um, you get one special rule with a blade detachment, and that is all units without the bulky or slow and purposeful special rules from this detachment have the hit and run special rule. So that's pretty much all infantry, uh, except for like terminators and and uh, uh, obliterators and stuff like that. Um, the detachment is split up into a bunch of different formations, just like any other combi detachment. The core, I didn't bother making like a form, like a super formation for it. Instead, I just said, you know, two to six units of Chaos Space Marines, and they can buy their rhinos for free, but not the upgrades. And then zero to six units of cultists. Um, if they have ten or more, they can buy, or sorry, ten or less, they can buy a Chimera as their dedicated transport using the points costs in the Codex's Astra Militarum. I, I don't know about you, Snorri, but I think that should be a core rulebook thing. Yeah. I think it may, it would make sense. They probably either defected from the Astra Militarum or they've managed to scavenge some. So I think it should be an option Yeah, of some sort. Maybe just make it... Something that can break down a little bit easier than mm-hmm. a normal Chimera would because these probably don't know how to maintain it properly. Right. And they don't have the favor of the gods to help them keep it maintained either. No. So I think I think that would make sense. So for this, you know, a blade has to be quick and, it, the, you know, they do these lightning raids. So I would think that they, they do have Chimeras at their disposal for this purpose. Um, you get zero to one command, which could be Lord Valda Galvanus himself. Um, if you do take him, he has to be your warlord, and uh, everyone within 12 inches of him get the zealot special rule, and this counts as his warlord trait. Uh, if you don't want to take Galvanus, you can also have a warpsmith or a dark apostle, which are very rare in the Brotherhood of Blades, to be perfectly honest, but you know the command is 0 to 1, so you don't actually have to take one of these HQs as a command. You can instead kind of you can use that... Um, uh, Ascendant Brother template or Champion Corian or Champion Zige to create a, an alternative Warlord for your army without picking an HQ. Um, after that, you can pick 1 to 10 auxiliary choices. Um, one of them is called Three Heads of the Hydra, which is three three units of Chosen, and one of them must contain Champion Corian. Um, they get the infiltrate special rule, and while Corian is alive, whenever one of the other two units of Chosen are completely destroyed, they go into ongoing reserves instead. I thought that was pretty interesting rule. What do you think, Story? I like it. We cut off one head of the Hydra, it comes back, another one grows back in its place. <laughs> Actually, if you're going to do that, then uh, technically we should say that as long as Corin is alive, whenever one squad goes down, you actually gain two squads. No, oh God, we're, we're not going to go into D&D rules because that would be really hard. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's going to be in the uh, territory of the, oh, I can uh, bring 5,000 points on the table and uh, I've got 6,000 more units that I'm going to just summon in for free. Yeah, the proper... No, the pro- we're not going down that route. No, you, you, you're absolutely right. The proper way would, would be to actually bring in two more units where one where one fell but for sanity's sake we're gonna do one <laughs> yeah um then we have the brethren of the dark covenant which is a crimson slaughter formation and the cult of slaughter which is also a crimson slaughter formation uh these are basically formations that kind of manipulate the use of things like uh, the cultists and stuff like that you can also take one demon engine pack which is a black legion formation uh, in addition, for the auxiliaries, you can either you can also just simply pick a fast attack elite or heavy support to go into the army. At the end of the day, you can also have one Lords of War as part of the as a part of the detachment. So I thought that would be a fun, uh, fluffy chaos detachment for the Brotherhood of Blades. It makes sense. I mean, you can't have all the Black Templars formations because they really can't. They don't have any sorcerers. All they have are these crones that they, this crone that they use uh, for some of their battles. Um, they don't have any other lords. It's just Lord Galvanus. So um, it, this this is really meant to represent this uh, story and the, and whatever stories come after it. And uh, as Adam said, we do have a formation for you, and it's called a Swift Strike Cavalry. 
In many cases, a fast and mobile cavalry is required for both reconnaissance and striking at flanks. This type of force also excels at chasing down and routing enemies. The formation consists of three to five skimmers or flyers capable of skimming mode, and includes infantry units with vehicles such as these as dedicated transports. Right, so if you wanted to do a unit of, say, Dark Eldar warriors, you could just you could you you could do that as part of this uh, formation as long as you took a one of their ravagers or or um, vipers as dedicated transport. Vipers? No. Yep. Viper? Is that right? Whatever. You take one of their dedicated uh, transports, one of their fast skimmers. You can you can have them as part of this formation. Yep. None of us play Dark Eldar, so uh, apologies if we mess up. <laughs> uh, special rules. They have two. The first one is uh, fake, which means that at the end of their movement phase, you may swap the positions of two vehicles in this formation as long as they are within 18 inches of it, each other. You may only do this once per formation per turn. And the other one is duke, which means that in the assault phase, all vehicles in this formation which have not been immobilized may move 2d6 inches in any direction, but may not pivot, but may not pivot as they do so. So basically, it's just like, woo, pedal to the metal and go wherever it takes <laughs> us. Yeah, it's that's cool. Like where where they just uh, they could just uh, kind of do that assault move types that type thing. I think that's fun. Yep. Cool. So that covers pretty much all the rules for the characters and formations and so on. So uh, it's time to take a quick break. And when we're back, we'll be doing some uh, campaigning. Yes, yeah, some scenarios. Finally, mm-hmm. bullets will be flying. Mm-hmm. The Nova Open Charitable Foundation, NOCF, is proud to announce the opening of the fourth summer season on the 1st of July, 2016. The Nova Open created the NOCF to promote the compassionate force of the worldwide community of tabletop wargamers and their willingness to support these causes. Since its inception, the NOCF worked with the miniature wargaming community to raise over $60,000 for charities such as Doctors Without Borders and the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. You can help by purchasing tickets for a range of raffles for armies and miniatures painted by world-class artists. There is a $10 minimum at checkout. Take your chances on any one or all of the nearly 20 online raffle items. Participants can purchase unlimited tickets at a dollar per ticket for the following. The Bad Moon Squadron Orc Army, which is the NOCF Premier 2016 Consortium Army. Nova Marines Adeptus Asardis Space Marine Army. Mjolnar Space Marines Army. Flames of World War II Soviet Tank Company. In addition, only 750 tickets are available at $2 per ticket for the following special raffles. Infinity Achilles Limited Edition 10th Anniversary Edition Miniature. Horus Heresy Pride of the 14th Legion Detachment. X-Wing the Emerald Empire Ships. Also, only 750 tickets are available at $2 per ticket for single model prizes. NOCF will raffle 11 models that winners can have delivered to their homes. Buyers can take a look at the models on the NOCF website. They will be shipped to the winner anywhere on the planet with deliverable address. Note that most armies include a storage case donated by KR Multicase. See the website for specifics. Help the mission, spread the word, share the newsletter, blog post, web post, Facebook away. Together we can make this the best fundraising year ever. Tickets for these raffles sell quickly, so make sure you pick up your ticket today. If you have additional questions, please email novacharities at gmail.com. To donate, visit our website at novaopenfoundation.org. Thanks for helping to make a difference. This is Gav Thorpe, and you're listening to the Masters of the Forge, where the world of 40K comes to life on your tabletop. And that was the last of our messages. Before we do more messages later. (laughs) But uh, it's time to uh, get cracking on the campaign. All right. Rock on, rock on. So uh, the first scenario we have is called the cleansing. So this represents uh, the Black Templars. They've arrived at Arviat orbital stations. And they're kind of, they're bent on cleansing the region of the Dark Eldar menace known as the Coven of the Agony's Kiss. Of course, purge the Xenos. Yeah, well, duh. Um... 
So for a full narrative version of this mission, uh, one player will select units from the Adeptus Astartes Space Marines Codex, using the rules for Black Templars, while the other selects uh, their units from Codex Dark Eldar or Corsairs to represent the Coven of the Agony's Kiss. Uh, for this Zone Mortalis mission, the Black Templars will use the Attacker Force Organization chart, and the Dark Eldar will use the Defender Force Organization chart. But you can play any size battle you wish. Both players roll off to see who decides to deploy first, and the player deploying first also goes first unless their opponent can seize the initiative. The game uses variable game length, and if you are playing on a Zone Mortalis battlefield larger than 4 foot square, you may wish to delay the end of the game, or sorry, you, then you may wish to delay the end of game rolls for one turn. Yeah, I've found that Zone Mortalis, when it's big, it's hard. You, you're ending the game before the real action gets gets going sometimes, yeah. so it's good to have like another turn. The way you set up your Zone Mortalis board is, well, any way you see fit. It's an orbital station and it's pretty old and messed up so you know any locked doors that are could technically be completely messed up and malfunctioning and will never be open unless you have some uh, cutting tortures or something melta melta bombs melta guns what is it called that uh, chain fist thing oh yeah yeah chain fist <laughs> that'll take care of business <laughs> yep and uh, if they if these doors are malfunctioned they are considered locked for both players. Messed up door is messed up. Yes. Yeah. And finally, for deployment, players deploy in opposite corners of the battlefield outside of a nine-inch circle from the center. Cool. There we go. Cool, cool. Uh, so for the special rules, it's simple. Uh, reserves, night fighting, and zone mortalis. Um for scoring, however, we have Purge the Alien. Uh, players score one victory point each for any destroyed enemy unit. Um, you uh, Additionally, you're going to score some points for holding ground. So for this one, we complete, we, we separate uh, the table into two foot squares, and each one of those is like a scoring zone. Uh, if you're running on like a three foot by three foot table, then just divide it into quarters. Um Actually, if you're playing on the 3x3, three three, why not just make the scoring zones 1x1? One one? Yeah, you could do that too. Um, yeah, hey, that works, ideas. That works, that works totally fine. So there, it, to score it, you have to have the most units completely within those scoring zones um, at the end of the game. And it, we, it, doing it with completely within makes it so much easier than trying to determine who's half on and who's half off and stuff. It's simply better to make it so that every, to score, you actually have to have the whole unit on there. Um, and actually, that makes a good case for having a uh, one by one foot, or sorry, a one foot uh, scoring zone on a three by three, mm -hmm. because then you actually have an odd number of tiles. Yeah, it's pretty nice. It's a good idea. Brr. Um, for secondary objectives, we have uh, one victory point each for Slay of the Warlord, Line Breaker, and First Strike. First Strike being basically the same thing as First Blood, except your opponent has an opportunity to respond after uh, the First Blood has been scored. And that's uh, scenario one. Boop, boop. So uh, after this fight, uh, we're moving on to uh, the second scenario called Waltz of the Skimmers. So this represents the... The, the part in the story where the uh, Dark Eldar and the uh, Black Templar skimmers are kind of dancing their dance of death outside the walls of the space stations. Yeah. The Coven of the Agony's Kiss are attempting to make a break for it, but they are being chased down by the relentless Black Templars. Both the Dark Eldar and the Black Templar player may only use the Swift Strike cavalry formation to build their armies although they may take as many of the formation as they need to fill out the agreed-upon points limit. The full narrative version of this mission... Oh, sorry. For a full narrative version of this mission, allow the Black Templars to take two Crusader squads in addition to their skimmers. So basically you're just going to have a whole bunch of skimmers and very little of anything else. It's kind of like... It's almost like a... Like a... Uh, what, what's the old... Game type where it was just vehicles. 
Spearhead. It's like Spearhead except only skivers. Yeah, I was about to say uh, a proper uh, like World War II furball. Mm-hmm. Both players roll off to see who decides to b- deploy first, and the players deploying first also goes first unless their opponent can seize the initiative. The game wi- uh, game the uh, the game uses variable game length. Word. Uh, the battlefield for this mission is basically a lot of tall line of sight blocking towers. Of course, not everybody has tall line of sight blocking towers, so you can use your imagination and just use ruins. If you do that, um, go ahead and just say that they're kind of um, impassable so that you can kind of get the, the impression that you're flying around these tall buildings. Um and of course, you can add whatever other terrain you want for your own specific narrative mission, narrative uh, campaign. So this would this mission would be great maybe if you're in a desert and you have just a bunch of tall like um, rock formations. This it would work for that as well. Thinking Monument Valley kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Exactly, Snorri. Exactly. Or Star Wars yeah. Peter thing mm-hmm. from that movie we don't talk about. <laughs> Um, for this, uh, for the, uh, deployment, we, we use hammer and anvil, get a bunch of skimmers on each side there. Uh, for special mission rules, we have reserves and night fighting. In addition, we have a lot of special ones. One is called hugging the terrain. Flyers may not go into zooming mode during this mission. So if you decide you want some, if you decide to change factions and stuff for this mission, and you're using Imperial Guard, or if you're, you're decided to take some, uh, Storm Talons, uh, those flyers can't go into flyer mode. They're treated as skimmers throughout the throughout the mission um because just simply because of the pirouetting and and extreme maneuvers that that you need to do um the next one is called drift if a vehicle is jinking and more than 25 percent obscured by a building or ruin they get a plus one on their jink save so you can you're not only getting cover save from jinking but you're also getting a cover save from the building as well we have evade a vehicle may, instead of shooting, choose to go into evade mode until the start of their next turn. At the start of their opponent's shooting phase, an evading vehicle may move up to 3d6 inches. So you might hopefully be able to kind of get around a corner or even possibly move so you're behind them and they can't shoot you. Or something weird like that. That might be a fun, fun little mechanic. The scoring and victory conditions are from the Purge the Alien mission. So uh, just go look that up in the book and you will find them. Yeah, basically just kill points. We've got enough special rules here that (laughs) you're better off with a simple mission. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, there is also a variant of this mission that uh, we call Thieves. In this variant of the mission, one player, the, uh, sorry, one player plays the attacker and the other plays the defender. The attacker is trying to get away with precious cargo. When any of the attacker's vehicles are destroyed, scatter the placement of an objective 2d6 inches from where they were destroyed. Each objective is worth 3 points if held by the defender, while each surviving skimmer is worth 3 points to the attacker. So if if your if your skimmer if the attacking skimmer is alive, um, it, then that means you have the cargo and you're going to leave with it. Otherwise, if if the uh, defender shot down your skimmer and is holding the objective that fell out of it, they get points. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yep, that works great. So for mission for scenario three, we're back on the station. Uh, on one of the RV orbital stations, um, where the Brotherhood of Blades have taken advantage of the weakened position of the people there and are making off with both material and slaves. The Black Templars have returned to exact justice upon the Brotherhood and once again rescue the people of Arviat. So for this, the armies are obviously the Space Marines using Black Templars rules and Co- Chaos Space Marines using the Brotherhood of Blades. Uh, this is another Zona Mortalis mission, and the Black Templars use the Attacker uh, FOC, while the Brotherhood of Blades use the Defender Force Organization chart. Uh, you can play any size battle you wish for this game. Uh, so for this mission, it's the same as always. Uh, who rolls? Uh, or we roll for who goes first, and all that stuff. You can seize, and if you're playing on a Zona Mortalis board, 
larger than four by four foot, then you can delay the end of the game rolls for one turn just to make things a little bit more exciting. Mm-hmm. The battlefield itself is uh, a Zomor Talus board set up the way you want it. And uh, you deploy in opposite corners of the battlefield outside of nine inches of the center. Place a single objective as close to the center of the battlefield as possible. Then players take turns placing one objective each in each of the four quarters. Um, using the usual place, or sorry, using the usual rules for placing objectives. So six inches from the table edge, 12 inches from each other, and so on. You got it. Uh, note that for this mission, the objectives simply represent holding ground and are not impassable, nor are they mysterious. Yeah, they're just representing uh, the the uh, the forces hold, you know, taking and holding parts of the the uh, station. Yep. So, um, um, if, if you if you want to, uh, you can probably try to set the uh, set up the uh, objectives in like tactically mm-hmm. smart areas, like. Uh, uh, choke points or something like that, just to uh, show that this is an important, a tactically part. important, yeah, yeah tactically important uh, location. Right, absolutely, Snorri. Uh, for this for this mission, we have uh, reserves, night fighting, and Zilmer Talos. Uh, we're also going to use the catastrophic damage table. At this point, this, these stations have taken so much damage from it being attacked multiple times, like once by the Dark Eldar, once by the Brotherhood of Blades, and twice by the Black Templar. So we're going to turn on that, that Zomartalis catastrophic damage table for this mission. Um, and as far as door control, the Brotherhood of Blades have actually managed to gain control of the station prior to the mission, and they can, they can open and close locked doors at their leisure. Um, one of the interesting, like the, the main interesting uh, special rule of this is the civilians. In addition to the armies... Uh, randomly place six units of five cultists throughout the battlefield. Uh, these represent Arviat civilians. They don't f- they don't fight unless assaulted, and they wield only a single close combat weapon each. Uh, civilians can be controlled by moving within three inches of them and within line of sight with another unit. If a player controls a unit of civilians, they become part of the player's army for all purposes. These civilians remain controlled until the end of the game, unless your opponent manages to gain control of them. Uh, civilians controlled by more than one unit will favor the force with the most models within line of sight. So basically, if you meet in the middle and there is a unit of civilians sitting there, um, and both of you have a unit within three inches, whoever has the most models, whether it's in that unit or not, within line of sight wins there. Uh, loyalty. So the the civilians can't assault or anything. So they're basically you're just moving them around, keeping them safe, or who who know using them as chaff. Who knows? <laughs> you get them in the way. You can assault them and stuff. You can kill them if you want to. But uh, as you'll see in the scoring conditions, you might not want to. Yep. And uh, as Adam said, we're uh, moving on to the scoring and victory conditions, and uh, we do have five of them. The first one being Purge the Alien, where the Black Templar wants nothing more than to annihilate their foe. They score one victory point for each destroyed enemy unit. The Brotherhood of Blades is desperately trying to hold the line. They score three victory points for each objective they hold at the end of the game. So basically the two forces are both playing different scenarios from each other for their main objective. Yep. Um, It's called asymmetrical objectives. Yes. The third one is Rescue, where the Black Templars receive two victory points for each surviving squad of civilians at the end of the game. Uh, The Brotherhood of Blades have their own version of this. It's called Slave Trade, and they receive three victory points for each squad of civilians they control at the end of the game, for reasons. (laughs) And, of course, we have Slay the Warlord. Players score one victory point for the enemy warlord slain by the end of the game. Yes. All right. Cool. So uh, next, the next mission is quickie. Um, basically, it's the representing the assault on the world of Yolanda at the Imperial Lottery. I I think it's best just for folks to pick whatever 
whatever uh, uh, mission they want to use for this. It's really just a simple assault mission. So any, really any mission will be fine. Um, I suggest giving, giving Maelstrom missions a try if you haven't used them before. Uh, something like that. Um, the armies are going to be uh, Adeptus Cesarte, Space Marines with Black Templars rules, allied with Astra Militarum, and they're fighting against the Brotherhood of Blades. So we're finally at the last scenario, and that is called Counter Assault. The war between the Black Templars and the Brotherhood of Blades has come to head. The Black Templars rally the Yolanda PDF to meet the Brotherhood's assault head-on. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> uh, knowing the Imperium? Everything? <laughs> For a full narrative version of this mission, one player selects the units from the Adeptus Astartes Space Marines Codex using the rules of the Black Templars and allies in some Astra Militarum, while the opposing side selects from... Codex Chaos Space Marines, using the rules for the br Brotherhood of Blades. Yes! Brotherhoods of Blades. <laughs> there we go. Just completely messed it up. <laughs> That's good. Intentionally, yes. this time. Uh, for this mission, players roll off to determine who deploys first, and uh, the player deploying first places only one unit. After they deploy one unit, their opponent deploys a unit. And this continues alternating until everything has been deployed. Note that independent characters and other models which must be attached to units must be added as the parent unit is deployed. They may not be added afterwards. The player who deploys first also goes first unless their opponent can seize the initiative. And we're talking about variable game length here. Yes. Uh, for the battlefield, it's a war zone littered with destroyed vehicles and abandoned bunkers. Uh, feel free to also dot the landscape with crumbling ruins. Uh, the deployment is Vanguard Strike. Uh, for the objectives... The, sorry? The hated diagonal yes, deployment. the hated diagonal <laughs> deployment. Um, for the objectives, note that one of the ruins in the Imperium deployment zone should be designated the Yolanda Lottery Gate. So just go ahead and tuck that into your, you know, deep into your corner. Uh, players then take turns placing one more objective each in the Imperium ha table half. Uh, these objectives may not be placed within 12 inches of the gate. We have some special rules for this mission. Um, of course, we have reserves and night fighting as usual. Uh, we've also got counter assault. During turns one and two, after the Chaos player moves a unit, the Imperium player may also move one of their own units as long as they are not moving closer to their own table edge. So the cast player, if you know, when the cast player moves, the Imperial player gets a free move. Also, in any turn of the game, immediately after the cast player makes a successful charge, the Imperial player may also attempt to charge. So, um, say at the beginning of the uh, chaos assault phase, you know, one of the units assaults one of the Imperial units. Well, then immediately after that, one uh, Imperial unit can also assault. Either, it doesn't matter who, probably the the Chaos unit that just assaulted. So I thought that would be a really cool kind of um, quid pro quo kind of way to, to do the battle and quite represents what happened in the, in the story. Uh, and finally, we have the scoring and victory conditions. The first is take the gate. The army with the most models in the Yolanda Lottery Gate at the end of the game uh, scores 8 victory points. The army's warlord counts as 5 models for this objective. Eh? Yeah, so he, he so if you have your warlord in there, you count as having 5 5 models for him instead of just one. Oh, right. Uh that makes sense. Uh the second one is push the lines. Players score three points for each other objective they hold. Uh, players also score one victory point for each destroyed enemy unit at the end of the game, although units of Chaos Cultists and Imperial Guard platoons do not score victory points for this objective. <laughs> They're just fodder. Yep. And uh, last, the uh, Slay the Warlord is uh, a three-point uh, objective in this uh, scenario. Yes. So I w I'm actually pretty proud of this mission. I think this is a cool mission. 
Yes, I love I I love the uh, counter assault rule. I think that's fun. I'd like to try this one out, uh, listeners. If you, if if any of you uh, try out these missions and these characters, please let us know and tip us the line and uh, let us know if if there's anything we can change to make it more fun. Um, we definitely uh, wish we could play test every single thing we produce, but. Uh, who has the time? So uh, <laughs> please help us out there. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess we could uh, have some more messages, come back and close out the show, right, Smart? Yeah, we do have time for that, I think. All right. Do you play more than one mini war game? Or do you like listening to shows which discuss other games and pan hobby topics? Combat Phase is a weekly podcast covering the whole hobby for gamers. We also interview a lot of Black Library authors. Join Kenny and Robert as they try to grow the hobby. Combat Phase, the best part of the game, is on iTunes and www.combatphase.com. Interested in the offbeat world of 40K? Is your bits box full of 20-year-old space elves? Have you ever searched for something out of production 40K on eBay? Well, hold on to your zotes and head over to Corsair Radio. It covers the full scope of the hobby, homebrew rules, fluff, campaigns, oddball models, and more. From Terra to the Eye of Terror, visit us at CorsairRadio.blogspot.com. That's CorsairRadio.blogspot.com. And with that, I promise you no more messages. Mm -hmm. Actually, just these messages. Uh, We do have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. We have a blog, mm-hmm. mastersoftheforge.com. Mm-hmm. Facebook is uh, pretty obvious, so I'm mm-hmm. just going to do the blog. Uh, we, or you have a Twitter account. Mm-hmm. Masters of Forge. And uh, what's the last one? I think... Uh, um, iTunes reviews, please. Give iTunes. Us, it helps us so much if you do some iTunes reviews. Uh, yes. So with, exposure. With helpful things. Oh, yeah, we love exposure. I'm wearing pants today, though. Can you believe it? I'm wearing shorts. Nice. It's too hot for pants today. Well, I'm wearing shorts. I mean, I'm wearing anything at all rather than just free balling, you know, up in here, which is what I yeah, usually do. Yeah, well, you, you dressed uh, appropriately when we had uh, Gav Thorpe on, so uh, yes. it's okay for you to wear uh, shorts today. <laughs> um, I just want to let everybody know, please, if if you're interested, we have a friendly tournament at Terminant. We have a friendly tournament coming up August 27th at 9 a.m. at Flipside Gaming in East Greenbush, New York. We'd really love to see some happy faces there. Uh, basically, it's going to be like my first round of the first. There's going to only going to be three rounds, 1850. The first round is going to be um, narrative uh, uh, pairings. The second round is going to be um, challenges, so you can challenge somebody for your second game. And then the third round is going to be totally random pairings. And it's just there is not going to be any competitive prizes at this one. Just uh, uh, door prizes, random, randomly generated door prizes for people, and also um, appearance score. And uh, what's the one where you're a nice guy? What's it? Uh, sportsmanship and sportsmanship. Yeah, this one there's not going to be any. Competitive prize. However, we are gearing up for I decided to bite the bullet and we are going to do the Golden Sprue Cup this year as a GT. Um, January 21st, 2017 is going to be a ITC ranked grand tournament in East Greenbush, New York. Uh, we're getting the um, Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, house in uh in East Greenbush, and we're going to be able to house quite a few people. So I hope folks come to that. Uh, we're biting the bullet and just, we're going to pay for extra space. And, and, uh, we really hope folks come to that and support our group and support our area and get those last few points before the, uh, uh, Las Vegas open. Uh, We'll be probably one of the very last, uh, GTs before, the Las Vegas Open, and likely the last one in the Northeast. So get your points, get in there, hang out, have fun. There's going to be a bar, so yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a red carpet, celebrities, <laughs> paparazzi. <laughs> paparazzi. 
So it'll be a good time. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll have a lot more details about that as time goes on. I just wanted to start the ball rolling on the promotion of that because we are putting our kind of our necks out there with some money and stuff for this. So I hope folks uh, are interested and, and come and hang out. So, so basically, since it's two days, the first day is going to be ranking for the finals. And the second day is going to be three games of finals from the top eight players. Everyone else is going to uh, start a new one, and it's going to be a 40K friendly event that goes on simultaneously. So, uh, you know, the second day will still have meaning for people who didn't make it into the top eight spaces. I thought that was really important. Yeah. It's kind of stupid to uh, just uh, come up there and uh, expect to have something fun to do for two days and then to realize that, that yeah, after the first day, you don't really have any reason to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought that would be a lot of fun. So, And the prizes will reflect that uh, at the end of the day. It'll be, it'll be an interesting kind of way how that works out. But uh, again, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, uh, we'll have episode 63 in a week, but until then... Play the game the way you want to? Yeah, the way you want to. The way you want to? The way you want to. And that means uh, the way you want to, not Adam and me. Yeah, you can tell, you, can, you should tell us to go ourselves because... <laughs> yep. Take, take what we uh, create here and uh, do your own thing with it. Absolutely. You don't have to play it and, by the books. And share it with us too. We like that. Yeah. We like it yep. when people share Ooh, speaking of that, we have to, um, a listener sent something. We, we should do that for an episode 63. A listener sent us, uh, some questions for help with a, uh, a campaign and we should look at that. Ooh. Maybe that'll yeah. be, maybe that'll be episode 63. Yeah. That's, uh, hopefully a, a nice little break from, uh, talking about second founding stuff. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I think we covered the second founding, well, not quite to death, but uh, quite quite well now. Yeah, I think we got that. I think we got the lockdown on, on second founding, that's for sure. Yeah. Wait, are so, we? did we finish the episode? <laughs> I thought we did. <laughs> All right. Anyways, All right, play the game the way you want play, to. Yeah. Okay. Blah, 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 play the game we want to. Bye-bye. <laughs>